this is our last session. And in our previous sessions, we introduced an uh, overview of leader development and discipleship. In our particular approach, we use three main components. And what are they again? Everybody together? They are goal, process, and design. So the first full day, we focused on the goal. And our goal is our description of what a, a disciple, a healthy disciple looks like, or a healthy leader. And that description is briefly what? The goal is five C's. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we acknowledge that our tendency is to emphasize competency, the, the last of the five C's. And because of that, we have tended to produce people that maybe still are dealing with character flaws, unsure of their calling, maybe removed from the community, isolated in some sense, if not physically, then emotionally. And because of that, under duress, they can't stand the strain. And so for some reason, their ministry may fade away or fail completely. And of course, that's not what will help promote the kingdom and bring the kingdom here to earth as it is in heaven. And so we want to address that. We want to build up not only a greater quantity of healthy disciples and healthy leaders, but we want to build up a greater quality. And so if we want to reach this big goal, five C's, we need, we need a, a process that will help us. We want a healthy leaders. We need a healthy process. And so our process is as comprehensive as the goal. And how do we describe our process? It's four Ds, four dynamics. And here again, we recognize what's our default of the four dynamics? What is our default? Yeah, we tend to go to the instructional. That's what we're used to. As Carol helped us realize, you know, that's easy. It's, it's easy to do competency on the goal, and it's easy to do instruction on the process. And our tendency is to teach others as we ourselves were taught. We, we tend to just repeat. We reproduce. And because of that, we're not used to developing the context for learning that we learned yesterday is just as important as developing the content for learning. So for me, a big takeaway in this is we need to put as much energy, thought, and design into context as we put into content. And hopefully that you saw that from the examples of Scripture in this parable, the seed and the sower, and the example of Jesus as he tried to teach the disciples to grow in character. When, even when he, the greatest teacher of all, focused only on the instructional dynamic, he did not achieve the transformation. And, uh, but yes, God is the ultimate designer, and he gave them a real context for learning in which uh, which was extremely effective, so that by the time Jesus passed the baton to the disciples, they were now men of humility, uh, and God could use them for his own glory. So that's what we're after. Now, that, the goal and the process are important, but it doesn't end there, as you know. We have the goal, we have the process, and then our last element, sometimes pictured as a triangle, uh, or these two images superimposed, our last element, design, is what we want to focus on today. And I'm going to do it in two ways. I'm going to, first of all, take kind of a, a general look at design. Because we can design our context, the context for learning that is ongoing and kind of, um, I don't want to say fixed because that makes it seem mechanical, but we have an ongoing way of designing, in a general sense, things that permeate our culture regardless of what topic we're teaching. But then we have another way to design that is topic-specific, content-specific. So we'll touch on both, and I want to first of all go through a general look. So we're going to look at the dynamics one at a time, one more revolution. And we're going to be thinking design, though, this time on this revolution. And I'm going to ask you once again to recall who it is that you're trying to train. So we begin today. Bring to mind those individuals you thought of in our first session. I asked you to think, who am I responsible to influence? And as you think of them, we'll, we'll think what designs will be practical for their uh, growth 
and development. Okay, so hopefully this can be something that you can put right to use once we leave. Okay. All right, are there any questions before we jump in? Understand where I am on my map and what I'm doing today? Yeah? All right. Well, let's charge in. This will be uh, a little bit fast-paced because we just don't have a lot of time. Uh, but by the end of the session this morning, we'll take a break. We'll take one break I th uh, this time, I think. Um, but by the end of the, the morning before lunch, we'll be doing some uh, specific design work, and I think you'll really enjoy yourself. Okay? All right, let's jump in by looking at the spiritual dynamic. And in your workbooks, we're on page number what? Page number 44. Page number 44. As I mentioned earlier, each dynamic helps us make a critical connection. And the critical connection for the spiritual dynamic is connecting with God. All right? And uh, on this particular page, you'll see some of the biblical principles about the spiritual connection. And one thing that I find really interesting is that in the scripture, uh, we know that apart from God, we can do nothing. And yet, some scriptures indicate that we have responsibility in this regard. Uh, we know that we are dependent on con upon God for his grace and that he must initiate, otherwise we can't do anything. And yet we have other scriptures, like in James, where it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so one of the first things I want to talk about when we talk about this issue of the spiritual dynamic and design is, whose responsibility is it that we grow spiritually in our connection with God. Whose responsibility is it? Is it God's? Is it, is it our responsibility? Whose responsibility is it? Okay. Queen is saying ours. Kath said something different. I said, is it this or this? And she said, yes. You know, an interesting, an interesting way of saying both or all, right? I think that's what you're getting at. Other comments? Let's just talk about this first. Whose responsibility is it? God initiates it, but it's our responsibility to respond. Okay. All right. Roger summarizing some scriptures that we know. He's saying God initiates, but it's our responsibility to respond. Do you have a scripture for that or, or a, a couple you want to share? Uh, Off the top of the head, no. Okay. All right. You looked at like that kind of guy that could do that, so I didn't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> Anyone else? You have a scripture about that or a uh, point of view? Okay. So Beck is bringing up this point that, especially in regards to younger children who can't initiate for themselves or wouldn't have the inclination, then we have a role to help them. All right. Good. Are you familiar with the scripture in Philippians chapter 2? Is that, that the one you were looking at? Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Exactly, yeah. Work out your salvation, which is a really interesting text, but then it reminds us, for God has worked in you. We can't work out what's not been worked in. And I think the scripture is really helpful to helping, helping us to see that there is some sort of balance. We can't work out of nothing. Only God creates what, what's in the Latin is called ex nihilo, out of nothing. Only God can create out of nothing. So unless God has worked something in us, there's nothing for us to work out. So we are ultimately dependent upon him. And the passage you were mentioning yesterday, you know, Paul planted Apollos watered, but what? God made it grow. So there's another text that refers to God's role and, and our dependency upon him. But again, then we come back to that text in James, draw near to God. Sounds like we're initiating now, doesn't it? And he will draw near to you. So let me use some images for you to see if we can capture this. And I want to use the analogy of, of watercraft boats. So let's, let's just compare three kinds of boats. You're thinking, wow, how spiritual is that? 
And uh, we have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some drawings here and let's see if you, can, if you can discern what my drawings are. Oh, somebody can see what I'm doing. All right, I'm so glad. All right, so that looks like a, a raft. Then we have... Okay. Okay, so we have a sailboat. And then we have a... Let's do a... Whoops. Uh, Let's put a big outboard on this, huh? What do we have there? Some sort of a speedboat. And I, I drew it crudely, of course, but... That's a raft. Sorry that doesn't look much like a raft, but... A raft. Okay. What's, what's the difference between all these three watercraft? Speed is, is one particular difference, yeah? yeah. The, power. the power. What's the difference in the power, Miguel? Who impulse to move. Yes. What's the cause of movement? What empowers it? The raft just drifts on the current of the river. It really does empower itself. It has no power. It just, it's just drift. There's a, there's a passivity, isn't there? On contrast, the total opposite end, we've got a power boat, whether it's a, you know, a fishing boat or a speed boat, but we've got something that has power and it takes control. It moves. It moves quickly, but it moves under its own power. Well, what about the sailboat? How is that different than both of these? Different power. Different power. How? Yes. How is a sailboat like the raft, and how is a sailboat like the powerboat? Okay. So there is, a, there is a dependency on the currents and the winds, just as this depends on current. This depends on current and winds. So how is it like this? Okay, Michelle says, you still have some control. What's the control? I thought we were dependent upon the wind. If the wind doesn't blow, we're... We're, the expression is dead in the water. So what control do we have, Michelle? We control the wind. Ah, so when the wind is blowing, we control the wind based on how we position the sail, or even, even first, whether the sail is up or down. <laughs> if the sail is not up, it doesn't matter if the wind is blowing. You're still dead in the water. You know there's two ways to be dead in the water? One way, if the wind does not blow, yeah. you're not going anywhere. You're dead in the water. But if the wind is blowing and you have not raised the sail, you're still dead in the water. <laughs> so I like the picture of the sailboat as a description of our life in the spiritual dynamic. Because we don't, in the spiritual dynamic, we don't power our own life. Nor do we drift and just say, God, I'm not going to do anything. Zap me, you know. Now, sometimes we do pray for that. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Yes. We want to be quiet and wait upon God. Yes, there's times for that. But I think the sailboat is the best picture for our spiritual life. Because the wind is a picture of the spirit. And we know how both in Greek and Hebrew, the word for wind and spirit is exactly the same in both languages. So whether it's the word ruach in the Hebrew, it's the word for wind and the word for spirit. And the same thing in Greek, pneuma, it's the word for wind and for spirit. That's no coincidence. And so there's a quote that I love from a, a Christian from many years ago, centuries ago. His name is Francis Fenelon, and he said this, The winds of God are blowing, but you must raise your sail. So what is he saying? That God is moving. He is, in fact, moving. 
That's not, the question is not, is God doing something? He is. But if we don't have any sail on our boat, we don't gain benefit from what God is doing. So our part is raising the sail. His part is blowing the wind. We cannot make the wind blow. Just like in surfing. A surfer can't make the waves come. The surfer rides the waves. And very similar for us, the sailboat rides the wind. So here is the spiritual dynamic. The reason I wanted to share this is because I want you to see what we talk about initiative in this model. I don't want you to see your initiative in a proper perspective. There are things we cannot do and things we can do. What we cannot do is we can't make the spirit move. But we can't position ourselves before God. We can put ourselves in the path of God. We can raise our sail and capture the wind. And our goal is as in our life and as we help develop others, is we want to help them raise their sails. So in your, in your image of a sailboat, I, I want you to imagine a sailboat with many sails. And I want you to think of each of those sails as something that captures the wind of God and propels us, moves us along in our faith. So what are those things that capture the wind of God and help us to, to move along? Give me some examples. Prayer. Yes. Worship. Fellowship with others? Yeah. With God. We, and how do we have that fellowship with God? Devotional time, fasting. Yes, all these things that we listed previously in that quadrant of spiritual dynamics, you can think of as sails. And you can erect as many sails as you want. And you know, it's interesting, you can decide. If you want to be dead in the water, fine, don't practice any spiritual discipline. And you may wonder, I, I, I've been through seasons in my own life where I'm saying, God, um, Give me a love for the scripture. And then I'm not going to read the scripture until you give me a love for the scripture. <laughs> and what happens? I don't read the scripture. <laughs> it is. It's a standoff. And so we do have to put ourselves into this in some degree. We have to raise the sail. We do have to put ourselves into the word. We do have to put ourselves in a place where there's a wind to capture what he's doing. Right? And so... We position ourselves before God in this way. Now, in the area of making discipleship, we simply help our, the person that we're discipling or the person that we're helping to grow as leader, help them to see how to develop a routine and a rhythm of raising their sails. And what I found very helpful is to think in the spiritual dynamic about daily practices, weekly practices, monthly practices and quarterly practices and yearly practices. There's a rhythm. There's a rhythm. And I like the word rhythm. Uh, discipline sometimes sounds harsh. People don't care for discipline. But think of it in terms of music. And how do we play the music of our life? What's the rhythm? And it's so, it, 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 it's so comfortable and there's such strength and maturity in getting in a rhythm. Whether we're a musician or an athlete or whatever your example might be. It's great to get in that rhythm where all, now we're humming. We're really moving. And so the first question is, as we consider this, is what's your rhythm? Remember, we can't give what we don't have. We want to be healthy leaders so we can build healthy leaders because we reproduce who we are, not what we know. Remember that? So if we're going to be making healthy leaders, healthy disciples, we need to have a healthy rhythm. And so the question is, what, what are your daily practices, your weekly practices, your monthly, quarterly, and yearly practices? And what are you going to help others design for their own life? Earlier in this, 
this uh, seminar I shared with you, how I got to the point of burnout. I was at the end of, of myself. It's a good place to be in the sense that you can learn to depend on God, but it's a horrible place to be in the sense that it's painful. Uh, but one thing that came out of that for me was a reestablishment of my rhythms. I did not have healthy rhythms. So I had to totally rework this. And that's why you may again look at this and say, well, this is, this is kindergarten stuff. This is baby discipleship. Well, yeah, it is. But it's amazing how out of whack we can get, even as mature Christians who have walked with the Lord. And we don't realize that we've gotten into a rut until we step back and look at our life. Part of discipleship, healthy discipleship, is always stepping back to look, to reflect, to evaluate. And so this starts with an evaluation of your spiritual rhythms. So what I'd like you to do is you decide, do you want to take this, I want you to look at this idea of rhythm and your choice, look at your own life so that you can become a healthy leader, or look at the lives of those that you're discipling. I want to give you a choice. And I want you to work out, this is your reflection and your design, the general design. I want you to redesign your spiritual dynamic. Your choices, again, either do it for yourself so you can be a healthy leader or do it for those that you're discipling. Good. So we're talking about the spiritual dynamic. And what I'd like to do now is, again, uh, shift gears and look at the relational dynamic in the same way, big picture, design for, for general structures, general rhythms. And so let's turn the page in our workbook from... Um, a spiritual dynamic, I'm going to skip a few pages under the relational dynamic because you can read these for yourself. Again, in, in learning, I don't need to read to you everything that's printed here. You can go back to your chairs, yes. Um, so you can read for yourself, your adults. So I don't need to read it to you. I'm going to skip, though, to page number 49 because I would like to draw out one really great principle in the relational dynamic. And that principle is, leaders build leaders. Again, let me point out a misconception. In traditional training, we, we don't realize it all the time, but we, we have an unspoken assumption that books build leaders, that classrooms build leaders, that schools build leaders. And I want to say those things in contrast to this principle and the reality that Leaders build leaders. Remember the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 where God creates the animals and it, and it says that each produced its own kind. So we never see an alligator give birth to a kangaroo. Okay, just a silly illustration to show how ridiculous that idea is. In the same way, do classrooms give birth to a leader? It's like a kangaroo coming from an alligator. We have to realize that. There's something incongruous about that. But we reproduce who we are. So it, we need to give thought in our training. As we train leaders or make disciples, we have to give consideration, again, beginning with the end in mind. What are we trying to produce? If we're trying to produce church planters then our course of instruction must put the emerging leader in close proximity, in close relationship to church planters because church planters reproduce church planters. The same thing with pastors. We're producing pastors or missionaries or leaders, whatever we're doing, then whatever we're trying to produce, then those kinds of people need to be involved in, in the rhythm of the relationships. Because leaders build leaders. Now this, this principle actually has more than one point. And so I'm drawing out one of those points right now. That we reproduce who we are. There's another aspect to this statement. Leaders build leaders. And you notice in the phrase that the, word, the first word is plural. Leaders build leaders. 
I know this word is plural too, but I want to focus on the fact that this word is plural. Okay? Thank you, Carol. And how to do this with a diagram. Does that look like the leader you're training? Huh? One of them. They're, they need to quit fasting, don't they? Surrounding this, this emerging leader is, is a, a really wonderful mentor. Uh, yet that mentor has some gaps in their life. And this is not a condemnation. The reality is there was only one perfect leader as a human being. That was Jesus. So we all have gaps in our life. So no need to be condemned about that. But this, this mentor that is in this person's life has strengths represented by the solid line. And they have some gaps. Maybe they're weaknesses. Maybe they're actually character flaws. Or maybe they're just areas where they don't have the gifting uh, or the insight or the experience. But it's a gap of some type. Now, if we reproduce who we are, what are the implications then for this emerging leader being mentored by this person? That just, yeah, just as we reproduce the strengths, there may be a tendency to reproduce the gap. So in other words, if I am your only mentor, I'm pouring into your life, and I have no passion for evangelism and no vision for, no vision for the nations. Well, if I'm your only source, how are you going to get that? There's going to be a gap reproduced in your life. So what's the solution to this? What's the solution? Hint, hint. Let's put another person in their life. Shall we? Let's put another person in their life. Let's surround them with another kind of, of person that has different strengths and different gaps. So their, their life may look like this. Now, oh, look at this. So this, this gap in this person's life, the first one, is offset by this person's strength. This person who had the gap with no heart for evangelism, no vision for missions, is offset by this person who does have a heart for evangelism, a heart for the nations. So as this person influences the emerging leader, that passion, hopefully, is passed along. And this person who had a tendency to being prejudiced and bigoted, does that happen in the church? <laughs> um, that's counteracted by this person who has a lot of compassion and, and just, just tremendous grace. And now, but it can happen that, uh oh, we've got two gaps still that are overlapping a little bit. What do we do then? I think you've got to figure it out, don't you? What, what, what do we do? Let's just do another one. Calls for another color. So we bring another leader into their life, and again, they have different strengths and weaknesses, and my, I'm not able to erase that so well. So, but you, you get the idea. So the principle is leaders build leaders, and it has two parts. The first part is we reproduce who we are, not what we know. The second part of it is, since we do come with our own strengths and weaknesses, and we do want to produce a person who has the greatest advantages to develop themselves wholly, then we want to design, help them design their relational network in a way that they can learn from various people and draw strengths from each one. So as we design a training program, we need to think of the relational network in a general way and determine how can we create a relational network that is very rich? Because more is caught than taught. 
So for example, let me show you how I designed my school. And it's similar, there's some similarities with the school that is, you, uh, that is held here. My school had eight students. I put them in two groups of four. But I also didn't take this school outside of the church. It was based in the local church. Here's the local church. And it's interesting that when we separate schools from the church, it's like taking a plant out of the soil. We uproot it. And then we're surprised when they die. I can't tell you how many times I've heard of students who, or, or people who felt a call from God and decided to go to seminary. They left their home church, their hometown. They went to a distant city to go to seminary. And in those three years, their faith died. Now, that could be for various reasons. It could be because of what was being taught. But in some cases, it's because they're no longer relationally connected. So the best place to, to plan a school is in a community of faith, in the local church. And so that's what we did. We planted our school in the local church, and the students were in teams of four, the men and the women. But each of the students was paired with other members of the congregation. They had a relationship with me. Each of them had a relationship with me. I'll just do the top four so it doesn't get too confusing. Well, I'll do it all. But they each had a relationship with an intercessor, and maybe one intercessor prayed for two people. Another intercessor, well, I won't draw them all, but another intercessor prayed for two people. There were other intercessors. But in addition, because of the gaps in the intercessor's life, because of the gaps in my life, then there was a spiritual mother or father. Let me draw that as another color. There was a spiritual mother or father who, maybe a spiritual mother was a, connected with two students, a spiritual father with, with two students. And in this way, they got the benefit of at least three one-on-one -on -one experiences. The purple, purple, the green, green, and, okay, me, I, I drew myself in that same color as the outside. Okay. So we have a series of one-on-one -on -one relationships. Now, earlier I said it's not just about one-on-ones. The relational dynamic is not just mentoring. There is value in one-on-one -on -one relationships. But let's go beyond one, and let's stop thinking that of this idea of a super mentor that has it all. Instead, let's recognize that we have limitations, and, but let's offset those limitations by putting several people into their life. And then recognizing that it's not just about one-on-ones, let's put them in teams, because we know the wonderful advantage that comes when they experience relational friction or relational support from a peer, a, an equal, a, a fellow learner, okay? So we need to design a relational web for them. Now let me show you how I laid out my course because as I started to think about this and the power of context, I realized that we only have so much time. You uh, here in Elkhart have a full-time school, so you could pair your students with many, many relationships, sometimes as many as five one-on-ones. Our school was a part-time school, so you have to be realistic in your design. Because we had less time than a full-time student, then we had fewer relation, relational commitments. It's just being practical. You still had more than one, but you didn't have five. We, we, asked, we actually had uh, a relationship one-on-one -on -one with me, a relationship one-on-one -on -one with an intercessor, and a spiritual mother or father. But we didn't do a coach, we didn't do a host home, because again, they didn't have time. Just be realistic. Now, the other thing I realized was that if we were going to develop the, the engine of this context, the spiritual, relational, experiential dynamics, because the time was limited, I wouldn't have as much time for teaching. And so here I was really being tested in my belief in this model. Because I love to teach. Have you noticed? <laughs> and I thought, how can I give up my teaching time? But I was determined to try this because I, I knew there was, there was wisdom in it. So I actually taught less 
in the two years that we conducted the school. And you know what happened? I got better results than I ever got because I made time for the spiritual, relational, and experiential dynamics. Let me chart it for you and show you how we did it. We met only, we met once a week in a formal way for the school. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it with numbers. The whole group of eight met once a week on, let's say it's on a Monday. Sometimes it was a Monday, sometimes it was a Tuesday, depending on what semester we were in. The whole group of eight met. The next Monday, I wasn't even there. The two groups of four, foursome, foursome. The two groups of four met by themselves in their little foursomes, foursome, foursome. And because I wasn't present, the designated leader had to exercise leadership gifts. On these days, they did some relational things. They did some experiential things. They did some spiritual things. On this day, we also did all four or, or three of the four dynamics, um, but certainly strong instruction here. But we used the other relational context to focus on the other dynamics, strong relational stuff going on there. And again, the next week, we may have met an eight, the next week, two times four again. Now, this ended up being a very practical schedule for me because I travel at least 120 days of the year. So I could work out the schedule so that I was on the road while they were meeting in their small groups of four, their teams. And even though I did less teaching, I got a, a greater harvest. It was incredible. So I helped them choose who they were going to connect with. One day I came across a young man in the lobby of our church. He was in our school. He was 23 years old. He was weeping. And I said, why are you crying? It was uncharacteristic. And so I sat down with him and he said, since I was a little boy, I always wanted to have another man in my life. I had a good dad. His dad was a pastor, in fact. He said, I have a good dad but I always wanted another man to look up to, someone that really could help me grow. And I prayed and I asked God for that and it never happened. And he said, now finally that I'm in this school, I've got, I've got a mentor, I've got a spiritual father. And it, and it was such an impact in his life that he was, he was crying in, in joy about how significant that relationship was. Another story for you. The schools based on this model are all over the world, and one of the schools run in Asia by a particularly zealous, uh, zealous pastor who also loves to teach, shared this story about how he ran his school for a year, and, and he filled every day with teaching and, and the other dynamics as well. And at the end, they had a graduation celebration at which they asked the students to share what was most meaningful during the one year? Where did they experience the greatest impact? Now that pastor was looking forward to hearing all the accolades about how great his teaching was. But much to his surprise and chagrin, you know what he heard? From almost every student, not everyone, but many said, what was the greatest impact on my life was the relationship I had with the pastor's wife who cared for us during the week, who prepared the meals, comforted us when we were tired and, and struggling, listened to us, and prayed with us. That was the biggest impact. And he, he shares this story with great humility, right? Because he doesn't come off looking good in this story. But he shared this as a great awakening. Remember, we learned by doing? He started the school knowing all the concepts, and he would agree, yes, the relational dynamic is important, but what did he do? He clogged the schedule with the instructional dynamic. But then he learned by experience. He learned by what transpired that the relational dynamic had the greatest impact in the end, not the instructional. And he was convicted, and he was able then to redesign the school for the next cycle. Do not discount the power of what transpires in relationships. One-on-ones, vertical relationships, where someone is pouring into another, and peer relationships, horizontal relationships, where co-learners are living life together. 
Again, the idea is initiative. We can allow people to drift into relationships like the raft. Or we can demand that they are in relationship and we can kill the relationship. Or we can use relationships as a way, again, of raising the sail and letting them catch what God wants to do in their life. Okay? This is design. We're going to help design a relational network around the learner. Okay? So what this means is that even if, if you're doing it with your children, you, you want to introduce your children to other men and women of God and help them cultivate their relationship and encourage it, make space for it. And recognize, as a mom and dad, you, you're not going to give them everything. And in humility, acknowledge that before God and said, God, bring in the other adults who are going to supplement and provide what I can't. And you're going to take initiative to encourage your son or daughter. Hey, why don't you, why don't you ask Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so to see if you can hang out? Or why don't you talk to yourself, talk to Mr. So-and-so. Hey, my son really admires you. Would, you. would you see if you could hang out with him a little bit? You're going to be a matchmaker. And here's where I want to refer to that scripture in the Gospel of John where Jesus is hanging on the cross, and from the cross, isn't it amazing what he's, how aware he is of others? When I'm in pain, you know what? I'm not so aware of others' needs. And did you notice my tongue was in my cheek? I'm not very aware at all of others' needs when I'm in pain. But Jesus, in tremendous pain, looks down from the cross where he sees his mother and his disciple, the one who is dearly loved. And what does he say? John, this is your Mom, this is your... What is he doing? He's being a relational matchmaker. He's designing a relational web from the cross. Because it's that important. So as you disciple others, I want you to think of yourselves as relational connectors, not just for yourself, but for the benefit of others that you're discipling. Like Jesus, maybe in your own pain, Help others connect with those who will be significant in their life and their development. Amen? Amen. This is the relational dynamic. Now, we're, instead of, what I'd like to ask you to do is, is do some design, but I'm concerned that we're running out of time. So I'd like to give this one to you as homework. Look at your own life. And what sort of relational support do you need? And again, I want to use my own life as an example. When I was totally burned out and wanted to give up, I, not only was my spiritual dynamic weak, but my relational dynamic was weak. And I realized that I had to reconnect with significant people in my life because what I found was I was giving out, giving out, giving out into almost every relationship. And there were very few relationships where someone was pouring into me. So I had, to, I had to readjust. I had to rebalance. And what really helped me was a chart that I came across that during my, my uh, time of rest where I had to recalibrate. And in this, this was a very simple chart where someone asked, what relationships do you have that fill you, that add to your life? What relationships do you have that drain you? And what relationships leave you neither here nor there. They kind of leave you lukewarm. They don't phase you. They don't, they don't add. They don't subtract. And so I actually just very diligently just worked out. Now, now not everyone you know, not all your Facebook friends. That's not the point. But the people that you actually encounter and spend time with, where do they fall out? And so as a pastor, you know what I discovered? My chart probably looked like this. The longest one was the middle one. But the point is, there were very few in this column, and there were too many here. So I had to recalibrate. That's design of a relation, your own relational network. And you can do the same for the benefit of those that you disciple. Make sure they're relationally connected with people that will be healthy for them. Okay? So we're going to stop here. We're going to take a 10-minute break. But I'd like to ask you to do this for homework. Redesign your own relational network if you need to and help others to do the same. Once I redesign my relational network, I, I want to tell you, 
Oh, it was like a new breath of life. It was incredible. And I thank God for the people that God sent me. Thank you. Let's take a break.